with us. If you have your Bibles, like I said, go ahead and turn to Exodus chapter 1. That's where we're going to be this morning. And you know, in the ministry, um, one of the things that you really have to do as a preacher is preach in front of people. And I can remember some of my first sermons being scared to death. You could even say you, I had a phobia. You know, you'd get really, really nervous. And so some nights I would go up on Saturday night and I would preach my sermon a couple times. Uh, and now I just download it, you know, when I arrive to church here in the morning. And uh, that's an inside joke, by the way. I don't really do that. But, uh, but no, speaking in front of people, it it's, makes me kind of nervous sometimes. And even, even, even today, sometimes I get kind of nervous, whereas other days it's really not that big of a deal. But I think everybody has things that they're afraid of. Everybody has things that they fear. And really, phobia, right, there's fear and then there's phobia. A phobia is like an unhealthy, unnatural fear of something. And I'm afraid of heights, and you can even say I have a phobia of heights. I could be walking through a mall on the second level, and I will intentionally stay away from the glass wall, leaning over to the second place, because it kind of makes me sick. That's how bad heights really mess with me. It's pathetic. There are times when I get up on ladders and I can do okay as long as I don't look down, but I cannot stand heights. My wife, on the other hand, has an intense phobia of snakes. Anybody else? I don't like spiders. I don't like snakes, but she has an intense phobia of snakes. When we dropped the kids off down in Winchester, Virginia at my father-in-law, her father's house, we were on our way back. We had borrowed this truck because we were going to do some landscaping stuff outside. And we got to the road on the way home. It's like the, the road that our house is off of. And we saw this long black snake slithering across the road. And as weird as it was, after we passed it, she wanted to go back. Was that a snake? No way. Was that a snake? I want to go see it. Let's go see it. And so, of course, I'm like, do you really want to go see a snake? You, you hate snakes. This doesn't really make sense. Yeah, I want to go see it. And so she leans over in the truck and grabs a hold of my arm as I turn around and we go back. Well, the snake is still in the middle of the road, except this time it's a lot smaller. Instead of being stretched out, it had started to coil itself up because cars were passing by and it was getting defensive. And so I roll down the window and I drive by slowly. Well, another car is coming the opposite way. And all of a sudden, as we pass by it, the snake coils back and then strikes out at the other car's tire, and it flips my wife out. I mean, it's like she gets the heebie-jeebies. She can't even talk. She's shaking. It's really weird. I'm like, this is kind of an overreaction. You know what I mean? This is ridiculous. Get off of my arm. <laughs> well, a few months later... We, uh, we have this road that we go run on, and so, you know, Angel, she'll go run, or I'll go run while the other one's watching the kids. Well, she decided to go run, but it got dark. And there's this little dip at the bottom of the road where it's kind of like a bridge, and there's heavy woods on each side of it. And so it's dark out. She turns her flashlight on on her phone, and there's one thing that she's praying. God, please don't let me see a snake. Please don't let me see a snake. Please don't let me see a snake. Well, lo and behold, guess what she saw? The back end of a copperhead snake right next to her foot as soon as she turns the flashlight on. So she comes running inside, Rick, Rick. And I'm like, what's going on? What's going on? Oh, I, I, I saw a snake. I saw a snake. It was right next to my foot. I'm like, okay. She's like, come here. And I'm like, no, you're sweaty. <laughs> no, hold me, please. I saw a snake. It was, it was disgusting. And I'm like, get off of me. You're wet and sweaty. She's like, but I'm scared. I'm like, but the snake was out there. Don't touch me. Ew, it's disgusting. You're wet. I saw a snake. And she would not let it go. I'm like, pull yourself together, woman. <laughs> it is just a snake that you saw outside. There are a lot of things that we're afraid of. Fear can paralyze us and cause us to do things that are crazy. Now, that's poking a little bit of fun at my wife, but you put me about three feet up on a rock climbing wall, and it'll probably be worse. I'll probably pass out. That's how bad I am with heights. It's terrible. Now, there are different kinds of fear in the Bible. There's this fear where you are afraid of punishment, and then there's the sense of fear where you stand in awe of someone. The Bible talks about wives fearing their husbands, not as a tyrannical ruler, but as somebody that's worth respect, honor, that you stand back and you don't want to do something that displeases your husband. And it's the same way husbands should love their wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that we should love our wives so much that we don't want to hurt her or crush her or act in such a way that would bring dishonor upon her. Parents are called to, or children are called to honor their parents. 
to stand in all of them, to respect them. And when the Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, it's not talking about being afraid of God in the sense that he's going to whip the lash and punish us, but it's about standing in awe of who he is. Now, as I said, if you have your Bibles, I'd like for you to turn to Exodus chapter 1. If you remember from last week, we ended the book of Genesis chapter 50 with the main idea that what Joseph's brothers intended for evil and selling him into slavery, God intended for good. And God was working out the preservation of many lives and allowing Joseph to go through the low valleys that he went through so that he could ascend to be the second most powerful person in Egypt. He was the right-hand man to Pharaoh. And he saved many lives because there was a famine. But there was a bigger picture that was at work as well. God was bringing about the nation of Israel to produce the Messiah to save the world. That's the big picture. Well, Exodus 1 picks up where Genesis 50 leaves off. Joseph has passed away. Almost over 200 years have actually passed by from Joseph passing. And all of Joseph's family has come in to live in the land of Egypt where they're under his rule and under his authority and they begin to multiply and they grow strong. Well, a new Pharaoh gets appointed, Exodus 1 tells us, and he has a disdain for the Hebrew because he is motivated by a fear. And his fear isn't a godly fear, It's a worldly fear. It's a fear of losing power. It's a fear of losing control because the Hebrews are multiplying. And he he basically says this in Exodus chapter 1. If we don't do something about these Hebrews, they will leave us, they will rise up against us, and they will side with our enemies and fight against us. So he decides to impose some of the most horrific acts of evil that you could ever imagine onto the Hebrews. I'd like for you to read with me Exodus chapter 1, starting in verse 8. It says, now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. So there's really no history there. Joseph is a very prominent, recognizable, powerful man. He's passed away. A new pharaoh arises, and he never knew Joseph. And he said to his people, behold, the people of Israel are too many and too mighty for us. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply. And if war breaks out, they join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. So as I said, there's two problems here. Number one, we'll lose power. We'll lose control. They'll fight against us. But secondly, they'll escape. Why do you think he wanted the Hebrews to live in the land of Egypt? Because he wanted to enslave them to meet his own wealth and his own desires. Slave work, that's really what he wanted. And if there's not a lot of slaves, you're not going to accomplish as much work. And so he decides to do this. First of all, he sets up labor camps. We are going to deal shrewdly with them. He made them work and work and work, and he worked many of them to death. And then the other thing that he decided to employ after torturing them through hard labor is genocide. He instructs the Hebrew midwives who were responsible for helping the the Hebrew mothers bear their children and nurse them and bring them into wealth, and they begin to multiply. Here's what he told them. When a Hebrew goes to give birth, if it's a male child, I want you to kill him. If it's a female child, let her live. And you can see when ungodly fear takes root in a person's heart, it really does expose what our idols are. And as I said, for Pharaoh, it was money. It was power. It was control. And that ungodly fear found its way to manifest itself in some of the most horrific things you could possibly do, to enslave another person, to commit genocide against another race because of your ungodly fear. And that's the danger of worldly fear, is it motivates us to do really quite terrible things. And so the stage is set. Many years have passed. The Israelites are are growing in number and in might and strength. And Pharaoh is at war, not just against the people of Israel, but ultimately against the God of Israel. You know, when I think about this idea of fear of the Lord, I can't help but point to the idea that is follows here in Exodus chapter 1. Look at verse 16 and 17. Here's what he told them. When you serve as a midwife to the Hebrew women and you see them on the birth stool, if it is a son, you shall kill him. If it is a daughter, she shall live. But the midwives feared God. And did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but let the male children live. They feared the Lord. Now here's the question. The fear of Pharaoh, which is implied in the passage about power and wealth and control, is it the same thing as the Hebrew midwives, the fear of the Lord? What I would argue is not. 
But here's the other question, and maybe this is something that you've thought about when you talked about or read about the fear of the Lord. How can someone live in constant fear of the Lord and ever be happy? I mean, if this idea of fear, which I believe is false, is that we are afraid that God will punish us if we do anything wrong, if that's what the Bible means to fear the Lord, how can we ever live a productive, happy, healthy life? For spouses who have been in marriage, marriages that have been abusive, where you're worried about how the other person is always going to lash out, is that really a good quality of life that you want to live in? Or maybe for those of you who are children, maybe now you're adults, or maybe as a child now, you live in constant fear of your mom or your dad, that they're just going to lash out and hurt you, and so you're very timid around them, and you don't want to be punished, and so you're walking on eggshells. I mean, is that really what God wants for us? Is that how he wants us to view him? Well, I would say certainly not. Let me read to you this really radical verse in Psalm 130, verse 4. Here's what it says. But with you there is forgiveness that you may be feared. Well, hold on. If fear is putting people in their proper place, how is it that the love, the grace, the forgiveness of God is what produces fear in us? How is experiencing the grace and the forgiveness of God, how does that produce fear in us? Well, I think we've got the wrong definition of fear. And that's why when the Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom or we should have a fear of God, it means we should stand in awe of who he is. That our motivation for living, our motivation for acting just like these Hebrew midwives is not that we are afraid that God is going to punish us, but we are afraid to bring dishonor upon God. That God is awesome. That God is good. That when we live our lives, we do it in such a way that brings him glory. Do you see the difference? Worldly fear exposes our idols and plays upon our deepest evil desires, whereas godly fear shows that we love God for who he is and how he loves us. The Hebrew women are not acting out in a sense of, we're afraid that God will punish us. They're acting in such a way that says, we want to bring God glory no matter what the prince or the king of Egypt says. That's the difference. Now, how can forgiveness and grace increase the fear of the Lord? And here's simply what it comes down to is relationship. It's not that we're scared of punishment. As I said, it's the fear of bringing dishonor upon God. There are situations and circumstances in each of your lives in which you are faced to do the right or the wrong thing. What is your motivation for working well? What is your motivation for staying faithful in your marriage? What is your motivation for being an honoring parent or a respectful child? What is your motivation for being a good member on the sports team or living up to the code of standard with your ethical obligations in your place of work? What motivates you to do the right thing? Are you afraid of being punished? Or do you want to bring honor and respect to the people around you? And so that's what we're exploring this morning. You know, when we comprehend the God of grace, it does certainly increase our fear. We step back and we stand in awe of who God is. This is a very great God who is willing to look over our trespasses. But I think that there can be two errors to this. I think if we think of it like this, that if we look at God as simply someone who accepts everyone, it would certainly develop a warm emotion, right? Wow, look at God. He really does accept everyone. He loves everyone. But there really becomes a problem, and you know, like for instance, children who love their parents because they never get disciplined. Parents don't want to hurt their children, and so they never discipline them. And sure, sure, the, the child might love the parent, but the child is never going to respect the parent because the parent never draws a line in the sand. Imagine if God himself were to accept pedophiles who rape, murder, and hurt little children, and they laugh their way to the grave with a hardened heart. Now sure, you could look at a God like that and say, wow, what a God of love, but He's not worth following. God must draw the line in the sand when it comes to moral evils of that nature. But on the other hand, if God only accepts the most moral people in our life, it really will inspire this enslaved idea of fear that, wow, God only accepts the elite and he's looking to punish me. And so when we stand in all of God's grace and forgiveness and personhood, it really heals the air on each side. We know that God is moral. And he has a code of conduct that we are to live by, while at the same time, God forgives and he loves. And so these Hebrew midwives are faced with a choice. Should I follow the king's command, patriotism over the providence of God, 
And should I obey my master and submit to his authority and do what is right in his eyes? Or should I obey God? And that is a tension that many of us probably feel every single day. You see, to fear the Lord simply means this. He is the center of your life. When you look at your fear, and we're not talking about phobias like snakes or heights or spiders. When you look at your motivation, why you do what you do, it says a lot about what the center of your life is. It's either going to be God and your relationship with him, or it's going to be some other thing like power or money, and these things will begin to define your reality. In fact, if money or power or relationship or sex is at the center of who you are and what you, what you love, even your relationship with God will begin to be shift and motivated and changed by that thing you love the most, that thing you respect the most. You see, faith in God and fear of the Lord It changes how we perceive the world and the lives around us. We are no longer motivated by this judicial consequence of our sins, but we instead are motivated by deep love and a sincere relationship with God. And so this morning, I'd like to challenge you with this idea. Do you follow after God because you're afraid he's going to punish you, or do you follow after God because of who he is and how he loves you? You know, at the end of the day, we can't consider ourselves as wise people if we don't have a healthy fear of the Lord, and an active relationship with him. And these Hebrew women, if they didn't have a relationship with God, they're nothing more than a moralist, a person who tries to do the right thing, avoid bad karma in their life, but instead they act because they fear the Lord. And if I could put it in a key phrase, here's what I would say. To fear the Lord is not to be scared of him, but in respect and awe of God, we are overwhelmed with the greatness of who he is and how he loves us. Timothy Keller puts it like this. That is why the more we experience God's grace and forgiveness, the more we experience a trembling of awe and wonder before the greatness of all that he is and all that he has done for us. Fearing him means bowing before him out of amazement at his glory and beauty. We are not scared. We are in awe. Where in the world did the Hebrew women get this kind of information from God? I mean, the Bible does say faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of the Lord, hearing the word of Christ. How in the world are these Hebrew women without a Bible acting in faith and out of fear of the Lord? How did Moses come to compile the books of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy? Where did he get this information about Genesis from? Well, here's where he got it from. Moses got it from his ancestors, who got it from Israel and his 12 sons, including Joseph, who got it from Isaac, who got it from Abraham, who got it from their ancestors, dating all the way back to Adam and Eve. These oral traditions about who God is and what he has done for us were passed down from generation to generation to the point where these Hebrew midwives have developed a courageous faith, a healthy fear of the Lord. Isn't that incredible? Where is your idea of courageous faith going to come from? It's not going to come from the world. It's going to come from these stories just like the Hebrew midwives, and as we will see, Moses. And so what does godly fear do? I'd like to think of three things that godly fear will do for you. Here's the first thing. thing. It will drive us to act in honor because we fear we will bring dishonor to the Lord. And maybe this is something that you can relate to at your job. You want to do a good job because you don't want to bring shame on yourself and on your boss. Or maybe kids is, you know, kids and their parents. You want to honor your parents. You want to bring glory to them. You want them to be proud of you. And so you act in such a way that makes them proud of you. It's the same thing it is with God. When we have a healthy fear of the Lord, we will act out of honor. Here's the second thing a godly fear will cause us to do. It will motivate us to act in wisdom because we will care more about what God thinks than what other people think. And I can be honest with you. There's really only one person that I prepare sermons for primarily, and that's the Lord. Am I honoring God? Is my motivation to please the congregation and the people, to be a cool hipster minister so that we can grow and we can become a mega church and we can do all these really cool things? Well, that may be secondary motivations. Not that I want to be a hipster, okay? That was just an example. But most importantly, that I want to honor the Lord. And if we live our lives in such a way with that primary motivation, when it comes to your families or your job or your sports teams or your peer groups or your relationships, you should be driven by a healthy fear of the Lord that depends upon what he thinks of you, 
not necessarily what the people around you think. And then thirdly and finally, godly fear keeps us from making the same kind of mistakes that we see in Pharaoh. Because our fear isn't grounded in our own insecurities or our narcissistic ideas or our own moral values, but it's grounded in fear of the Lord. Pharaoh's got a big problem. He is afraid that these Israelites are going to rise up against him and take control of his money and take control of his wealth and he'll lose everything. And that shows a lot about who Pharaoh is. But my question to you is simply this. What do you fear the most? And what does that tell you about yourself? Look at Exodus chapter 1, verses 18. Here's what we find. So the king of Egypt called the midwives and said to them, Why have you done this? Well, done what? Well, they didn't obey the Lord's command as we saw last time. Why did you do this? They put their lives on the line for obeying God rather than man. And let the male children live. And the midwives said to Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous, and they give birth before the midwife comes to them. So God dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and grew very strong. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families. First of all, in this ancient time, one of the worst things that you could have is to be barren. It would actually be viewed as a curse from God. And so the fact that these women, these midwives, were able to have children and families of their own really said a lot about how God was working in his providence. But here's a question that's often asked. Did God bless the midwives for lying? Obviously, this isn't true. We know from other biblical evidence, like Rachel, for instance, she had a very hard uh, childbirth. And we know that, for those of you who are ladies, childbirth would not be easy, especially at this time. They had two rocks that they would sit on and they would pull on a rope as they tried to give birth to their child. Not an enjoyable experience. They didn't have medication, right? They didn't have the things that we get to have today. Um, they couldn't get an epidural on their back. You know, my wife got an epidural. And I, in fact, I cannot imagine the experience without one. And that's me. <laughs> I mean, holy cow. Childbirth. Let's not even go there. Anyways, Here's the deal with these Hebrew women. They come to Pharaoh and they say, look, we just can't get there in time. You mean for the last 60 days, these hundreds of thousands of people, you just couldn't get there in time for one of them? Obviously, they're not telling the truth. But it's not that God blesses them because they lied. <clears throat> God blesses them because they feared the Lord and they didn't carry out the king's commands. Here's the deal. You are asked to do things all the time, even by your own feelings, <coughs> or the people around you, to do things that violate the moral standards of godly living. And here's the question. Who are you going to obey? Who do you fear the most? Do you fear the Lord to do the right thing? Or do you want to blend in and fit in and find a way to make an excuse and do the things of the world? You know, when I read this passage of Scripture, I couldn't help but think of Proverbs 19.23. The fear of the Lord leads to life. Then one rests content, untouchable by trouble. Here, these Hebrew women fear the Lord. <coughs> it led to life. They had their own families. <coughs> the Israelites grew. Now, this is a proverb, not a promise. Does this proverb mean that we will never experience hardship or pain in our life? Absolutely not. But here's the general truth. Fearing God over man, a healthy fear of who God is and what he has done for us, it leads to life. Look, there's one thing that couldn't be taken away from these Hebrew midwives. You know what it was? the Lord. And with that eternal perspective, it motivated their action to honor God rather than man. And I hope that that same thing is true for you and I. God is our haven in the storm. He is our defender. Trouble can take you away from everything and everything away from you except for the Lord. And for these Hebrew women, God was the greater safety. God was the greater choice. God was more powerful than Pharaoh. And he was the one who they ultimately chose to follow. And so in this act of courageous faith, these Hebrew women embraced their fear of disobeying um, Pharaoh, and they absorbed that fear. They could have died. He could have sanctioned their death for disobeying him, but instead they act out courageous, courageously. And here's the deal. What a remarkable skill to learn. Can you imagine standing before the President of the United States, and he tells you to carry out the abortion of infants, and you refuse to do it? I mean, think about that. Or standing before your boss and he tells you to smudge the numbers and you know that if you don't, you're going to lose your job and you don't do it. Or if your spouse asks you to engage in some type of sexual immorality, knowing that it could cost your very relationship and you don't do it. 
or your friends who want you to engage in things that violate the law and hurt your body and cause you to forsake the Lord. And you know that if you don't do these things, it's going to cost you your friendship with them. But you don't do it. These Hebrew midwives had a whole lot to lose. But they cared more about who God was and what he had done for them than even their own lives. Great personal cost. And you know how they reached this conclusion? Do you think it just a switch flipped overnight? (laughs) No. It's practice. Facing trials, enduring tribulation, experiencing hardship, it brought them to the point when the moment happened, they feared the Lord over their own lives and the lives around them. How is that going to happen for you? Do you think the moments of hardship and the choices that are hard for you are just by coincidence? Or do you think the Lord is wanting you to use those opportunities to refine your character, to change who you are so that you will do the right thing? So next time you get in a fight with your spouse and they have completely lost it, are you going to do the right thing or are you going to do your own thing? The next time you're tempted to be lazy or neglect work or do something evil at your job, are you going to do the right thing or are you going to do your own thing? Whatever the circumstance it is that God permits you to go through, he wants you to utilize those situations to bring him glory, to refine your character. And this is exactly what we find in the New Testament. Romans chapter 5, verses 3 through 4, we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And this is a long and painful process, but the only way you get to the point of making big decisions like this are the small daily decisions when your character is being refined. And look what happens in Exodus 1.22. He doubles down. It wasn't just enough to say, okay, I tried to do this in secret. I tried to kill them in secret. Now he simply tells them this. Every son that is born to the Hebrews you shall cast into the Nile, but you shall let every daughter live. Genocide, full-blown. I don't even want you to try to kill them in secret on the birthing stool. Now, once they're born, drown them. Throw them into the Nile River. Let them be the food of the crocodiles. Can you imagine, for a moment, policies that indicate and triumph for and celebrate the death of a child? It's terrible. Welcome to America. That's exactly where we are in a nation. Thanks, man. I'm like, my throat is itching so bad up here. So, you guys are like, I'm tired of hearing you cough. (laughs) But that's where we are. How do you think you overcome a group of people who are growing in power and strength? Well, eliminate their children. One of the greatest assaults on America is the elimination of our children. There are even politicians running right now who advocate for abortion across the world so that we can save our planet, that we could actually use United States taxpayer dollars, our own funding, to support abortions across the world for the health of the world. Pharaoh has lost his mind with genocide. He has a great hatred for the Hebrew people. He tries to do it through infanticide, and he's going to lose. He is going to lose. And so when we act out, and fear of the world, it causes us to do really terrible things. So let's just take the life of innocent children. And it really shares a lot about who we are and where we're at in our own journey with God. And so Pharaoh could have killed these women for disobeying his previous command. He doubles down in the hardening of his own heart. He commands them to drown the children in the Nile River because at the center of his life was power, control, and wealth. That's what he cared most for. At the center of my life is the resurrection of Jesus, which implicitly implies the existence of God. God is at the center of who I am. And so if God says that I should do something, that's what's true. And that's based on objective truth. That's based on fact. That's based on the historical argument for the resurrection of Jesus. For these Hebrew women, God is at the center of who they are. And so it dictates their action. When it comes to killing children, they decide, well, that's probably not the best thing to do. Why? Because God is at the center of who I am. What is at the center of your life? What do you fear the most? And what kind of fear do you have? Let's end with Exodus chapter 2. We're going to read 10 verses to kind of summarize the story because there's another action of faith that's really quite incredible. It says, Now a man from the house of Levi went and took as his wife a Levite woman. 
And the woman conceived and bore a son. And when she saw that he was, fine, was a fine child, she hid him for three months. And so they have a baby boy, and they hide him for three months. Why? Why did they hide him? Well, the edict was, drowned him. She couldn't do that. She couldn't cross that moral threshold. And when she could hide him no longer, she actually took this basket. The word basket is ark, just like the word ark in Genesis chapter 6. And it was covered with pitch, just like the ark in Genesis chapter 6. And she places her baby boy in this basket, and she takes him down to the Nile River, and she hides him amongst the weeds, the text says. And she waits. Moms, can you imagine doing something like this? I can't imagine giving my child up to adoption or, you know, to be uh, taken over by somebody else. I mean, it would be a really painful experience. And here's this mom in desperation clinging to the promises of God. What promise? Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, I will make your nation many. Your descendants will be as numerous as the stars in the sky, as numerous as the sand on the seashore. And she's clinging to this promise and in acting out in faith, she decides to do what many of us would think would be the unspeakable. It's either kill my child or thrust him upon the grace of God. And so that's exactly what she does. And look at what happens in verse 4. And his sister stood at a distance to know what would be done to him. This little baby boy's sister's watching. Now when the daughter of Pharaoh came to bathe at the river, while her young women walked beside the river, she saw a basket among the reeds and sent her servant woman, and she took it. And when she opened it and she saw the child, and behold, the baby was crying, she took pity on him and said, this is one of the Hebrews' children. And so Pharaoh's daughter finds this baby boy. And then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, so the sister's watching, and she sees Pharaoh's daughter get this baby boy, and so she goes up, and she says this, shall I go and call a nurse from the Hebrew women to nurse the child for you? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, go. So the girl went and called the child's mother. And look at this, moms. And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this child away and nurse him for me, and I will give you wages. (laughs) Can you imagine getting paid to bring your child up? That's kind of cool in the providence of God. Now, of course, you're thinking, well, I wouldn't have to want to give my child up in the first place. And I get that, okay? I'm just saying it was either death for her child or grace of God for her child. And through God's providence, he was able to orchestrate Pharaoh's daughter to go down and bathe at the Nile at this very point, take him into her household so that she could be called to nurse and bring her own child up. And here's what it says. So the woman took the child and nursed him, and when the child grew older, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son, and she named him Moses, because she said, I drew him out of the water. That's cool. God's providence at work. Here's what we know from this story. First and foremost, God is faithful, and God is sovereign. He's in control. God made a promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob He is not going to revoke that promise. He's not going to go back on that promise. He will bring about the nation of Israel to one day produce the Messiah. And God is working through the lineage of Judah to bring about Jesus. And Moses becomes an integral part of that story. Moses is a secret weapon, a secret weapon to carry out God's plan. And guess who else is a secret weapon? You. You are God's secret weapon to bring about the salvation of the world. And that's true for Moses. God is faithful. He is sovereign. He has not abandoned Joseph, as we saw last week. He will not abandon Israel, as we'll see over the next few days. And he will not abandon or forsake you. God is at work in your life. He's allowing you to go through terrible things at times, tough things at times, because through his greater plan, he is working out your good. And so here's my question. Do you trust that God is working out your ultimate good in this life? Here's the second thing that we know from Moses' story, is that God wants you to do the right thing even at great cost. You see, rather than choosing faith over fear, faith absorbs the fear. It places it into its proper perspective, and it produces courageous living. It was the faithfulness of the Hebrew midwives, the faithful, courageous living of Moses' parents that ultimately brought about God's providence. Here's what Hebrews 11.23 says. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw that the child was beautiful and they were not afraid of the king's edict. Where did their fear come from? A healthy perspective 
of who God is and what He's done for us. And so what motivates you? What is your fear? Is it losing your money? Is it losing your relationships? Is it missing out on what life has to offer you? Is it eternal damnation in hell? (laughs) Because even that is ultimately a wrong motivation for why we should love God and love people. What motivates you? A desire for success? A pursuit of an achievement? The need to prove yourself to your parents or amongst your peers? Are you driven by anger and hatred for the people around you just like Pharaoh or people who have wronged you? What motivates you? What is your fear? Well, if I give my money to the church, I won't have enough you know, money to buy things that I want, and I won't be happy if I donate. I can't afford to do that. Well, if I continue to be a Christian, I'll have to give up knowledge and reason and science, and I'll be laughed at by my friends and fears. Well, neither of those things are true. Science and philosophy was built on the belief that God exists and the universe was discoverable. Do you fear that if I stand up against corruption and manipulation by politicians, I'll become a target, I'll be hated, I'll be attacked, I'll be ostracized. People won't like me if I stand up for what's right. Do you fear that if you do what's right in your workplace, you'll be hated, schemed against? People will avoid recognizing you and wanting to be around you. Oh, there's goody two-shoes, not willing to overlook a few trespasses and do what's wrong with the rest of us. Are you afraid you won't get a promotion? What do you fear? Do you fear that if you run from sexual immorality, you'll never be satisfied? That if I stop committing sexual sin with this person, I won't feel whole. I won't be loved. I won't have gratification in this life. I won't feel accepted by the people around me and I'll never be happy. Do you fear that if you discipline your kids, you'll have to hold yourself accountable? And if you hold yourself accountable, then you've got to live up to the same standard of the people around you, to your own children. But if I discipline my kids, they might hate me. They might say, I hate you and I can't bear to hear those words and so I'm not going to discipline my kids. Are you motivated by a fear that your kids won't love you or honor you anymore if you stand on discipline through love and encouragement? What is it ultimately that you fear? Well, Paul says, look, if any of these fears is a greater controlling influence than the reality that God is good and he loves you, that is your idol. And that's what needs to be worked on. And so what do we do? Simply put, we should pray. The psalmist writer said this. He prayed that I may fear your name. God, help me develop a healthy fear and respect for who you are and what you've done for me. Secondly, meditate on the eternal perspective. Look, the Hebrew women are not looking at their momentary life. Moses' parents were not looking at their momentary life. They were looking at a much bigger life to be lived, eternity with God. And that's why Paul says we are always of good courage. We are courageous. We act in spite of our fear because we know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. Eternal perspective. And with this in mind, Moses' parents took a step into the unknown by placing that basket in the water. And my encouragement to you, take a step into the unknown and let God do the rest. If we are really going to live the right kind of life, If we are going to live courageous faith with a healthy fear of the Lord, we must trust ourselves into God's hands that he will care for us so that we can do the right thing. Let's stand and let's pray.